I'm John Robbins. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Normally I'm across the way. Michael's generally over here, as we know, but on occasion we switch, and I'm grateful for the privilege to be able to be here today. Michael Jarbo has a robe on this very second. Can you believe that? He had a tie on this morning. It's extraordinary. And we appreciate very much Colin Bagby leading a worship today, Drew and Reverend Jenny Tincher on a youth retreat leading the music and she's preaching. So they're out this weekend and we appreciate very much Colin leading our music today. Last Sunday, uh, Colin was in the 930 service on the main campus and at the end of the service of worship, I was out in the narthex greeting people and a couple of women, 10, 15 years older than I am, came up and said, hey, listen, can Colin not be in the 930 service more often over here? And I said, well, you know, we rotate clergy over there. So if he's not in 930, maybe in the other services, but a lot of times he's at the West Campus as well. So he just kind of moves around and they said, well, we'd like him to be over here a lot more at 930. And I said, well, why? And they said, well, because we'd like to look at him. <laughs> And I said, well, listen, I'm over here three times every Sunday. And they went, we'd rather look at Colin. So he's kind of fun to look at, isn't he? So's Drew, by the way. I, I know, I get it. So anyway, we, I appreciate the privilege of being here today. We continue a series of sermons um, called A Woman's Place. I'm actually the one that came up with the idea for A Woman's Place. Because I've heard over my years in ministry comments made to women, particularly clergy women, that I don't have to deal with as a man. Sometimes they're not necessarily inappropriate, sometimes they are. But there are a lot of comments that women have to face and issues that they have to deal with that sometimes, particularly in our line of work, I don't have to deal with. So I thought it'd be a good idea. Why don't we try and do a series of sermons entitled A Woman's Place about women's issues, if you will, and the uniqueness of women and the strengths that women possess and how important it is for us, particularly in the life of the church, where oftentimes, ironically, women take a back seat that we really stress the importance of women and the role they play in the kingdom of God. So I'm going to read a passage of scripture from the Gospel of Mark. There are actually two accounts that we find dealing with Jesus regarding women confronting men in the final days of Jesus' life, literally in the final hours. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. I invite you to hear these words. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is the word of God for the people of God. Jesus. Last week, if you were in the main sanctuary service worship, I um, would ask you to be patient with me for a moment because I'm going to read one of the things that I read last week over there. It is an article that I found from Good Housekeeping Monthly, 1965, entitled The Good Wife's Guide. Now, I was only a year and a half old when this was written, so I'm just the messenger, okay? <laughs> this is about the role a wife is to play with regard to her husband coming home from work. Listen, plan ahead, even the night before, to have a delicious dinner ready when your husband gets home from work. This is a way of letting him know that you've been thinking about him and are concerned with his needs. Prepare yourself. Put on some makeup, put a ribbon in your hair, and be fresh looking. He's been with a lot of work-weary people. Prepare the children. Take a few minutes to wash them up, brush their hair, and change their clothes if needed. Remember, they are little treasures, and he would like to see him playing the part. Have a cool or warm drink for him and arrange his pillow and take off his shoes. I'm the messenger. 
Over the cooler much, you should prepare a light fire for him to unwind by. After all, catering to his comfort will bring you immense satisfaction. Let him talk first. Remember that his topics of conversation are far more important than yours. <laughs> Never complain if he comes home late or goes out to dinner or entertainment without you. Instead, try to understand his world of strain and pressure and his need to relax. That's interesting, is it not? That's uh, almost 55 years ago, and hopefully at some level our culture has changed. Now, there is nothing wrong with preparing a meal if you are a female for your husband. There's nothing wrong with taking off his shoes. There's nothing wrong with having a nice, cool drink for him or any of those kinds of things. But we have advanced in a lot of ways with regard to men doing that for their respective wives as well. So it'd be nice to have an article today about men doing that for their wives who work or their wives who stay home and take care of the kids, whatever it may be. We become more sensitized to trying to make relationships kind of a mutual agreement with regard to showing respect to each other. I'm glad you're here today. Let's bow our heads. Oh Lord, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear your word for us this day and work your will in our lives. Amen. Dolores Huerta was an elementary school teacher in California. Her first day as a teacher, she looked at her respective class, and her heart was broken. Most of the students that made up her elementary school class were kids whose parents worked in the fruit fields, migrant laborers, predominantly Latino. She noticed that many of the kids came to school not only the first day of class, but throughout the year without any shoes on, wearing the same tattered clothes they had worn the day before and the day before that. Most of these kids did not have a lunch packed for the day, did not have money to buy a school lunch either. It was heartbreaking for her, and she wanted to do something about it. She recognized that many of these kids had parents who worked long, arduous hours in poor working conditions, nominal pay, not able to take a bathroom break all day long. Their drinking water oftentimes tainted. Here are these kids who are suffering greatly, whose parents are working long hours with very little pay being exploited and taken advantage of. And Dolores Huerta had enough. She ran into a man by the name of Cesar Chavez, whom we all know, and together she, along with Chavez, formed the United Farm Workers Association. Now Chavez has become the name behind all of that. But Huerta was very much a part of that as well. They made it clear to these migrant workers that in mass, if they would strike, they could have power to change things. At first, as you can imagine, there was a lot of resistance to that. These people, though they were working long hours for very little pay, needed any pay they could possibly get. But over time, they formed themselves into a union and they went on strike and everything stopped. Then all of a sudden they began to have increased wages and healthier working conditions and bathroom breaks and all the kinds of things anybody deserves in any place of employment. Dolores Huerta, an elementary school teacher, became keenly aware of suffering and injustice and in a very powerful and pragmatic way, she made a difference. What is a woman's place? A woman's place is to make a difference, to speak truth into a situation. And when injustice is a reality, it is a woman's place, along with a man's place, to try to do something about it. There are two occasions in Scripture in the final hours of Jesus' life where respective women confront injustice regarding Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, Pontius Pilate has Jesus paraded before him, 
and he says to everybody, I can't find anything wrong with this man. I need to let him go. There's no reason for me to hold him. The Jews press and press, and eventually we know how the story goes. Jesus is put to death. But before his death, Pontius Pilate's wife comes to him and says, I had a dream last night. You better let that man go. You better have nothing to do with him. My dream is clear. He is not a guilty man. Now, as we know, Pilate would literally and figuratively wash his hands of the whole thing, and Jesus would be put to death. But here is a wife who goes to a man in a position of authority who happens to be her husband, and she is keenly aware of the injustice that is about to take place, and she speaks truth into it. When Jesus is arrested and taken away, Peter and the other disciples kind of hang back and want to see what goes on. It's cold. Peter is warming himself by a fire when a servant girl walks up to him and says, you're with that guy named Jesus. And Peter, who up to that point in time had said to Jesus, I'll take a bullet for you any time, says, I don't know who you're talking about. A second time, that same servant girl approaches him and says, you are the one with him, the Galilean. I have no idea what you're talking about. And on a third occasion, Peter is confronted, and he begins to curse and says for a third time, I don't know the man you're talking about. I have nothing to do with him. And then the cock crows, and Peter begins to weep. It is a servant girl who is keenly aware of the cowardice of Peter and calls out Peter and his hypocrisy, and his unwillingness to stand up for our Lord in his desperate time of need. Two women, very different, one married to a man of great power, the other a servant girl, become keenly aware of an injustice and speak into that. A woman's place is to do that. We see that clearly in Scripture. Now what's interesting is, any of us who have ever reared children, particularly little girls, want those little girls to grow up and have the same rights and same opportunities as any man. And in the culture in which we live today, oftentimes that's the case, but not always. Sometimes as we get older, we begin to segregate, differentiate, compartmentalize people into certain categories, and this is a woman's place, and this is a man's place, and if a woman wants to be like a man, then we stigmatize her or label her in a very crude way. And it is grossly unfair and completely inappropriate, and it even happens in the church. You know, in the church, oftentimes, we lag way behind society in almost every way. And for centuries, women had no place of leadership in the church. And in the United Methodist Church, we like to boast about the fact that women have equal say, whether they're lay people or clergy. We have women bishops, women pastors, etc. But you have to realize, though the church has been around for 2,000 years, in the United Methodist Church, though it hasn't been around for 2,000 years, we've only ordained women for 60 years. That's not very long. There are still lots of denominations and lots of churches who have subjugated women to a status of inferiority when it becomes uh, something regarding the church. I read about a man who said one time, a clergyman in the Roman Catholic Church, who said, I find it interesting that a woman can carry our Savior in her womb, but a woman is not allowed to carry the name of our Savior from her lips in a pulpit. Wow. I'm done. See y'all. Gonna... I think one of the things we have to realize oftentimes is that we have put women in a position where they don't belong. They belong out front. 
In the culture in which we live today, there's more and more of that happening, we know. There are women Supreme Court justices. A third of the Supreme Court is made up of women now. The third in line for the presidency, the Speaker of the House, is a woman. There are more and more women CEOs. The president of the University of Houston is a woman. There's more and more of that, and there should be, because women have unique gifts, special skill sets, and particular perspectives on things that oftentimes are just different from men because they are different. And we all benefit from that when women take on that responsibility. Sojourner Truth, who many of you have heard about, I read a biography of hers many years ago. Sojourner Truth was a woman in the 19th century born into slavery. But she managed to pay her way out of slavery by her freedom. Sojourner Truth was very much an uneducated woman, not particularly articulate with her ability to speak the English language, but a powerful speaker nonetheless. She was an abolitionist, she fought for freedom, but she was also a women's rights act advocate. She was in high demand in certain parts of the country to speak about women's rights in particular in a time when slavery still had a firm grip on the South. On one occasion, she was invited to a women's organizational meeting in Ohio in front of thousands of women, and she stood up and in her own way, in her own voice, though I can't speak like she did, she said that women have a place. I ain't ever understood why there are men who say women ain't got the same rights as men. Who is your Christ when you say that, because what you say is, because Jesus ain't a woman, women ain't got the rights that men do. Well, let me tell you something, she said. If you think about your Christ, it involved God and a woman. There ain't no man in it at all. I like that. There ain't no man involved in it, if you think about it. Here's a woman an African-American woman who spoke truth regarding injustices in the 19th century, who was formally uneducated, crude in her ability to speak the language, but had a powerful voice and literally reshaped lots of things. Who says women aren't strong? I've seen my wife give birth twice. I'm telling you, she is a strong woman. Women are very strong. The notion that somehow women have to take a back seat to men because women aren't as strong as men emotionally or physically is an absurdity. Women oftentimes call out those things because they have a unique perspective that other men are not aware of. In this church, there are examples of that. Among the clergy, there are examples of that. And there have been examples of that in my ministry over the years. Oftentimes, the clergy women will say to me something that they have to deal with that I don't even think about because I don't ever have to deal with it. Now, that's a unique perspective and a point of view that I'm never going to have because I'm never thinking about those things because I don't ever experience that. So we have to understand that a woman's place is out front, taking the lead, speaking truth, speaking out those kinds of things that are unjust. And when women do that corporately, that is, in volume, it makes a world of difference. We know that now with the Me Too movement. Men played a role, a position of power, taking advantage of women, and women said enough is enough. Me too, me too, you too, yeah, you too. And all of a sudden, there's a voice behind all of that that is loud and strong. Unfortunately, even in the church, the church has been silent for generations regarding abuse, because men have been in a position of power and wanted things to remain the way they were and not mess with any of that, so let's just keep silent about it and we don't have to worry about it. And women finally said, enough is enough. We are going to expose abuse and injustice for what it is. And look at how that has changed the church. Women speak about all kinds of issues, and rightfully so. They have a place alongside any man. A woman's voice and a woman's place is to confront. And that can be risky. 
Sometimes women don't want to do that because they're labeled or categorized or stereotyped, but men don't want to do it either oftentimes. We'd rather remain in our little comfortable world. But one of the things that happens is when one speaks out, another will, and another will, and things begin to change, much for the better. There was a woman named Viola Desmond who was born in 1914 in Canada as a black woman. She grew to be one who did much good. At her young age, she was a beautician. She eventually opened up her own salon and then several others and had a significant amount of money, which was highly unusual for any woman, let alone any black woman, in the early part of the 20th century in Canada. Now, Canadian law still in a lot of ways, like in the United States, segregated people. And one day in 1946, Viola Desmond, her car wouldn't start, and she decided that the garage needed to work on it so she would have a few hours to kill. Why doesn't she just go to a movie? So she went up to the window to purchase a ticket to see a movie. She paid her fee, she was given a ticket, she walked into the theater, and she sat on the ground floor. Before the movie started, an usher came up to her and said, folk like you can't sit down here, you have to sit in the balcony. She showed him her ticket, and she said, I paid for this, I have a right to sit here. He called the police. The police came in. They said to her, folk like you cannot sit here. She said, I'm not moving. I paid for my ticket like anyone else. If you don't get up, we're going to drag you out of here, they said. She said, I'm not getting up. I have a place. So the police grabbed her and dragged her out of the movie theater, seriously injuring her hip and her knee. They immediately took her to jail and charged her with defrauding uh, the Canadian government. You see, what happened was, as a black woman, she bought a ticket that only white folks should be able to buy because it was on the ground floor. It cost an extra penny for the black folk to sit in a balcony. So she defrauded the Canadian government out of a penny and was imprisoned for that for a short period of time. She filed a lawsuit against the theater. It was immediately thrown out. She filed a lawsuit against the police department. It was immediately thrown out. Viola Desmond suffered greatly for trying to take a stand like Rosa Parks in remaining seated, years before Rosa Parks ever did her thing. Viola Desmond would die in 1965, and one day her sister, who was in college at the time, was taking college classes at the time, significantly older, was in a lecture, and the professor started talking about a woman in 1946, almost 20 years earlier, who had taken a stand by remaining seated. And she said, Professor, that's my sister. So Viola Desmond's sister and this professor began to make sure that her story was told out in the world. And as a result, her story was put in textbooks in Canada. And now if you go to Canada and you have a $10 bill, Viola Desmond's picture is on it. She is the face of the Canadian $10 bill. Just a woman who took a stand by remaining seated, who spoke truth into injustice and suffered greatly as a result. But it changed that culture. What is a woman's place? A woman's place is to speak truth. A woman's place is to be out front. A woman's place is to understand her sacred worth, her unique skill set, and put it to use for the greater good of the kingdom of God. That is a woman's place. That's just where she belongs. Let us pray. Lord God, we do recognize that even in the culture in which we live today, we have great strides to make and much work that continues to be done and continues to need to be done. 
But you do, in your own way, gift women with unique skill sets and unique perspectives, and how important it is for us to recognize that and put it to good use. So for our time this morning, reminding ourselves of a woman's place, we give you thanks. In the holy name of the one who honored women so powerfully, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.